The Holy Spirit is a person, is God, and yet he is distinct from the Father and the Son. Um, which raises this whole issue of the Trinity. But you can see this, that he's part of the triune God. By, sometimes he's listed right alongside the Father and Son. So when Jesus sends out his disciples just before he ascends, uh, he says, uh, go forth and baptize, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the parallel there, see, you, it'd be weird to say the Father, Son, and their influence, or the Father, Son, and their electricity, or something. Uh, no, they're all personal agents, and they're distinct from one another. They talk to one another. They interact with one another. So the kind of question that, of course, it raises is, how do you have, there's one God, you find that over and over throughout the Bible, there's only one God, and yet we find in the New Testament that the Father is God. Oh, but wait, the Son is God. Oh, look at this, the Holy Spirit is God. How does that work? Well, it's a mystery, so let's move on. <laughs> Ask Paul Eddy. He, he knows this kind of stuff. Find someone who's smart. They'll, they'll figure it out. Look, it, it is a mystery, but it's not, it's not a stupid mystery. <laughs> uh, and sometimes Christians, in the name of defending the triune God, make it into a stupid mystery. In the name of defending it, they make it untenable. So a, a pastor that I work, was assistant to a number of years ago, he went down and preached this message. He says, well, the, the Trinity is actually, the, 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 what's mysterious is that we don't understand the mathematics of heaven. On our realm, one plus one is two, but in heaven, one plus one plus one is one. And I thought, <laughs> who needs a mystery when that's the explanation? It's like, <laughs> there's a difference between a mystery and a contradiction. The very definition, I, I don't want to get into any further. Um, but look at, you know, Here's, here's an analogy that some, it kind of works. And all analogies are like something and not like it in other respects. So this is like the Trinity, but unlike in other respects. But think for a moment. Are you thinking? Yeah. Then who's talking and who's listening? Do you ever realize you've, you've got a voice in your head? And, and someone's speaking and someone's listening. Uh, in fact, but yet you're, you're one brain, I hope. One brain. And I hope it's just one voice that you're listening to. <laughs> It's too crowded up there. Get him out. Get him out. Um, there's help for you if that's your issue, but this is in the context. So, uh, and that, in fact, not only is there a voice and a voice listening, but there's a relationship between the two. Like sometimes, you, you, does that ever happen to you where you're thinking and you, you, hate, you hate the thought? Uh, you know, I, I wish that thought would go away or with that, wish that wasn't my image. And you really just don't like it. Other times you might love that thought. And, and, and so there's a relationship between the speaker and the listener um, and that's, so there's a kind of a threefoldness in you. Your brain is kind of threefold. And we don't know how that is. We don't know how brain, our brains are structured in a way that that can happen. We don't even know what consciousness is. So there's a lot of mystery about that. Uh, and if there's a mystery about just our own little brains, why shouldn't there be a lot of mystery about God? In fact, get this. Everything around us, everything that is real to us, if you think about it, is an incredible mystery. The only reason we don't think it's a mystery is because we stop noticing it. But we are swimming in a sea of mystery. For example, we all agree that time is real. I hope time is real. And yet think about this. Did it begin or not? Really a basic question. If any question about time should be answerable, it should be that. But try to conceive of there being a first moment without a previous moment. Impossible. Try to conceive of there being no, no first moment without a previous moment. It, 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 time never began. It just always was. Always was. Never. Try to conceive of that. Impossible. So it, it either started or it didn't, but both options are utterly inconceivable. Inconceivable. Uh, same thing with space. Does, does space have a limit or not? Picture it with a limit. Mm, what's one inch outside of that dome? Okay, get rid of the dome. It has no limit. Can you conceive of that? You can't. So limit or not, it's equally inconceivable. And so if the fundamental structure of time and space which we live in, if that's inconceivable, if our own brain is inconceivable, well then we shouldn't reject the Trinity because it's inconceivable. Or if you're going to reject the Trinity, then reject time and, and, and uh, space as well. Good luck with that one. All right. So God exists in, 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 in three distinct ways. That's what the doctrine of Trinity is all about. Now the way the New Testament construes this is basically like this. Uh, the Father is generally associated with God in his transcendence, his out thereness, his otherness, right? Uh, the Son is generally associated with God's uh, revelation to us. Um, he's sort of the face of God. When God turns towards us, 
it, it's the Son. He's the Word of God, the perfect expression of who God is in his essence. So the transcendent Son is, re, or Father is revealed through the Son. And then the Holy Spirit, here we come to the important part for us here, is sort of God on the ground. He's God with us, he's God in us. So when I think of the Father, I often think of you know, the infinity of the stars. When I think of the Son, I think of usually the incarnate Son. And when I think of the Spirit, I think of what we just meditated on. That's God is in us. He's God on the ground. One way to think about this, a real important verse that has been used throughout church history uh, to kind of flesh out what the role that Spirit plays, the way all three persons play in the Trinity, is something like this. In Ephesians 2, we read, Paul says that for through him, Jesus, the Son, through the incarnate Son, we both, and here he's referring to both Jews and Gentiles, which includes all humanity. So we could say we all have access to the Father by one Spirit. We have the incarnate Son, because of the incarnate Son, we have access to the transcendent Father through the imminent Son. Now the way, uh, the dominant way that the church has worked this out, goes back to the third century, uh, is, is this. Uh, Gregory, Gregory of Nyssa put it this way. Everything about God toward us originates in the Father, comes to us through the Son, and see the motion there, and then grabs us, if you will, in the Spirit, in the power of the Spirit, who then brings us to the Father through the Son. And you might note that that's a symbol of infinity. Because this is who God is within himself, but then in, in his relationship with us, who he is in, within himself gets, gets unfolded. And so we're caught up in the dance of the triune God. The Father, through the Son, the picture of salvation like this. The, the Father reaches down to us through the Son, who reveals him, grabs us in the power of the Spirit, and then through the power of the Spirit brings us back through the Son to be reconciled to the Father. And in doing this, since he's being exactly the kind of God he is within himself, so we are being enveloped into the dance of the triune God. 